hello everyone and a good afternoon from a surprisingly sunny North London and a good morning, afternoon or evening to you wherever you may be and whatever the weather may be. Welcome to the third Tic Tech Civic Tech Surgery, focusing on accessing quality information for civic tech success. I'm Gavin Freegard, a freelance consultant working with my society on the Tic Tech Labs programme. Among other things, I'm also an associate at the Institute for Government and a special advisor at the Open Data Institute here in the UK. And I am your chair, facilitator and host for today's event. Uh, do tell us who you are and why you're here in the chat if you'd like. Thanks to those of you who've already done so, very nice to meet you. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to discuss some of the challenges and dilemmas we face in accessing quality information. Think everything from open data and APIs to freedom of information and much else besides, and hopefully move towards some solutions to some of those challenges, aided by some fantastic speakers. For these first 10 minutes or so, I'm going to outline, outline how today will work and give you a bit more background to what we're hoping to achieve with the Tic Tech Labs program, of which this event is a part. Some quick housekeeping first. Today's event is on the record. It's being recorded and will be published online afterwards, along with minutes of today's event. You should be able to access a live transcript here on Zoom. Please let us know in the chat if you can't. You're very welcome to share details of the event on social media. The hashtag is TicTech. And if you'd like to contribute to today's discussion, you can use the chat here on Zoom and you can use the Padlet board that you'll soon get a link to if you've not had it already. There will also be a few opportunities later to unmute your mic and tell us what you're thinking as well. If you've not used Padlet before, it looks a lot like this. You'll see the various questions we'll be covering today on the screen. If you want to add something, just click on the plus signs that you should be able to see. We've already had some contributions. You can add more as we go along through the event today. And there will be a few periods of silent working during today's event where we've encouraged you to add more contributions. That's the housekeeping done. Now for a quick introduction to the Tic Tech Labs programme, which is run by my society with support from National Endowment for Democracy. The aim is to discuss and tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the global civic tech and digital democracy sector. We want to grow the civic tech evidence base, address some key issues, and enhance the effectiveness and potential impact of civic tech projects. Tic Tech, which stands for the Impacts of Civic Technology Conference, started as an annual global in-person conference in 2015. We hope that there will be another in-person event in the future, but in the meantime, through the pandemic, we've converted Tic Tech into a year-round programme of activities and events called Tic Tech Labs. Over the course of the programme, we're taking on six topics which have been identified by our steering group. You can see the steering group on the right-hand side of your screen as Civic Tech's biggest challenges, as well as accessing quality information, our subject today. Those subjects are public-private collaborations, ensuring Civic Tech is accessible, scaling and replicating Civic Tech, tackling the climate crisis with civic tech and storytelling and reach. For each of those six topics, we're going to organize a civic tech surgery like today's to delve further into the challenges and possible solutions. After each surgery, there will be an action lab, a small working group of around six people who will work together to commission a piece of work to help solve challenges raised. If you're interested in getting involved in the action lab, we'll tell you how to do so at the end of today's event. By the end of the Tic Tech Labs programme in 2023, we hope we'll have six pieces of commissioned work, as well as increased connections and learning across the global civic tech community. This is our third civic tech surgery. We currently have a call for proposals out on the first topic we covered, public-private collaborations, which closes on Monday, next Monday, the 28th of March. Check out the Tic Tech Labs website if you'd like to apply. And we've also had a surgery on our second topic, ensuring civic tech is as accessible and, in and inclusive as possible. More to come on that one over the next few weeks. Today, we're focusing on accessing quality information for civic tech success. And the big overarching question is, what would help the global civic tech community to overcome common barriers to accessing quality information? Underneath that big question, our objectives for today are to discuss the challenges involved in accessing quality information so we can establish which are the most common challenges across our global community, share how some of those challenges have been addressed to date, 
discuss what else might help tackle those common challenges that we identify, share any existing projects, evidence or research on the topic that might be helpful, and last but definitely not least, to explore how the Tech Tech Action Lab that will come together after this surgery can help address one of the common challenges we find by commissioning a relevant piece of work. This is how today's session is going to run. We're starting with this introduction, obviously. We'll then move on to a discussion of the dilemmas, challenges and barriers that people face in accessing quality information. We'll begin by turning to our excellent discussants for three minutes or so each. We'll then give everyone five minutes of silent working to add thoughts to the chat and contribute to the Padlet board. And then we'll see if our discussants have any reflections or if any of you would like to share some of your thoughts as well. Uh, this section will refer to question one on our Padlet board. What dilemmas have you faced or are you facing when accessing quality information or data for your civic tech projects? Then we'll use the same format, discussants, five minutes of silent working on the chat and Padlet, any further reflections, to ask what people have done to try and address those issues. That's question two on the Padlet board. After that, we'll squeeze in a short five minute break where you can grab yourself a drink, pop to the bathroom or add some things to the Padlet or the chat. After the break, it'll be the same format again to consider what might help tackle some of those challenges. That's question three on the Padlet board. What do you think might help you further address these issues, i.e. are there any evidence or resource gaps? We'll then have 20 to 30 minutes to consider two big subjects. First, whether any of us are aware of existing evidence and research that could help us tackle some of the dilemmas and challenges we've discussed. And second, given that the action lab that follows this surgery will commission some work, what project ideas we think we could fund to solve some of the problems we've raised. We'll start again with some silent working to add things in the chat and on the Padlet, and then have some time for us all to discuss. Right at the end, I'll summarize what happens uh, next in terms of taking this forward to an action lab. So there's lots of exciting discussion ahead of us this afternoon. To help us with that discussion, we have some fantastic discussants who will be sharing their experiences. They are Nehemiah Yalu Atiga, the co-founder and principal lead of ADECRO PMO in Ghana. We've got Sim Rowe from Democracy Club here in the UK. We've got Laura Zoma from the fact-checking organization Chequeado in Argentina. We've got Kirill Yusof from the CNAR project in Malaysia. He'll be leaving us at 3 p.m. But then joining us at 3 p.m. will be Natty Carfi from the Open Data Charter. So a fantastic uh, lineup of people to help us uh, through these difficult discussions. We're very grateful to all of them, as well as to all of you for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, so we're going to move to the first section of today's event. Uh, and that's all about the question, what dilemmas have you faced or are you facing when accessing quality information or data for your civic tech projects? As I said, that relates to column one on the Padlet. I'll ask each of our discussants to share their thoughts for around three minutes each. Then we'll have five minutes of silent working to add to the ideas on the Padlet or in the chat. And then we'll have a further five minutes or so to reflect on all of that. So uh, for the first three minutes, I'm going to go to Nehemiah, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, for us here in Ghana, it's usually an issue of bureaucracy than anything else. Um, and so whilst you'd think that um, information should be easily accessible um, or available, it's not that easy to have access to. I remember when we started Odipo, we had to, at a point, even purchase parliamentary um, information and, and, and data to, to be able to use them. We're, we're getting them in even hard copies and, and using OCR technology to, to extract the text from the scanned documents. But um, bureaucracy and the opportunity to circumvent it is, is what it, it is. And whilst bureaucracy exists for obvious reasons, um, it has also created a lot of inefficiencies that can be frustrating for everyone, whether a citizen or even an organization like ours. Um, and what has happened is you, you, found, you found yourself in a place where public servants or people who work in the parliamentary service will exploit this 
to their advantage by making below the counter deal. So someone will tell you that I can make sure that you get this information or this data, um, but I'll take this from you, even though it's supposed to be open. Um, and because you're also desperate to get that information to carry out your research or, or whatever work you're involved in, you would also end up maybe bending over and, and giving funds to these people just to get the information that you need. Um, so they sometimes will intentionally hoard the information requested until you pay the amount they're asking for. And so, for instance, if you are working on a corruption related project and you have to engage in corruption to get access to the data you are looking for, then you, you are actually back to square one because you're actually um, carrying out a corrupt act to get the information to fight <laughs> the corruption or engage in, in any effort around that. It, it's, it's an interesting place we find we find ourselves in, but that that, that is truly the situation here in Ghana. Um, and, and so that, that would be my first submission on this um, subject. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's go to Laura next. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, in Chequeado is based in Argentina, uh, but we have networked since 2014, working together with other fat checkers in the region. Most of the problems are in general similar uh, with perhaps difference in sensitivity in one uh, country or the other. Um, the problems are related with, the, in some cases, access, because uh, uh, there, there are laws or the decrees that allowed us to ask formally for information, but that laws are not necessary in all the cases apply uh, in the sense that the, the law uh, write down, then in some cases is they just don't answer or they don't answer on time or they use an exception that is not necessarily um, clear in the, in the law. And in, in a lot of cases, uh, journalists or small organizations are not necessarily going to the judges to discuss uh, if that uh, request was good or bad uh, answer by the government. And the other problem that we find is in some cases that the government, when, when it changed the party, uh, they changed in some cases the methodology or in other cases the periods in what they published the data. And then, for example, in Argentina, since 1997, we have the salaries of the teachers all around the country. We are a federal country. It's useful to, to share uh, to the community that they are really diverse salaries. Depends on the provinces. And, and the provinces that are more poor, in general, pay um, salaries that are not necessarily the best one, and, and all related to education explain us that we need the better uh, teachers and, and good uh, salaries for them in the places that are the most complicated. And, and what the data show us is completely uh, the opposite. And what happened this year is that the government stopped to publish that. And then we asked for that first informally as a journalist request. And they said, we decide not to publish anymore because it's not useful for discuss in an inflation context, the salaries of the public servant. And then what we did is a request. And after we did the formal request, they start to publish it again. Then uh, what, what that case or, or example show us is that there are a lot of things that are not necessarily um, uh, not discretional. Uh, we have the right, we have the constitution that allowed us to write, we have the laws, uh, and someone decided not to do it anymore because of political reasons, and that happened. And then uh, it's a small example that show us that we are not necessarily in a position where all the information that it should be there, it is. 
And the other problem that we find, especially for our project that is related to automatization of fact checking, is that the data that the government publish is not always in, in, a, in a format that the machines can learn or can read. Then that if I had to choose that two of the ideas, on, on one side, the discretion of each government to publish, to, to publish data or not, uh, more or less because of their convenience, and the other related to formats and, and how to do that. Excellent, thank you, Lara. Um, yes, I think uh, data quality issues and government's discretion over what it gets to publish, I, I, I suspect a lot of people will be nodding along uh, to that being a problem on this call. Uh, let's go to Kirill next. Hi, I'm Carol from uh, Malaysia. Um, yeah, so we've had a long relationship with my society <laughs> all the way back to 2013. Because um, we're uh, Malaysia is also a Commonwealth country, so there's a lot of things that are in common um, with the UK and which we've inherited. Um, so in Malaysia, you know, in terms of dilemmas, um, one of the challenges we face is the fact that we have um, a very kind of Jekyll and Hyde or contradictory um, situations with how the government does things. Uh, so on the one hand, for example, we have a strong um, federal led um, service uh, by government um, and public servants to open data. Uh, but on the contrary, there are you know, criminal laws that says a public servant uh, vaguely in the act of doing their work, uh, if they share information, uh, not specified what, uh, can face, for example, up to 250,000 US dollars in fines or a year's jail for sharing that data, <laughs> which another agency says they should be sharing. <laughs> so we have a lot of these kind of contradictory <laughs> situations. And um, what we've learned is that, you know, um, a lot of these laws, when you don't have a, like, for example, a federal um, Freedom of Inter Information Act or, uh, you know, or an open default data by default policy or, um, um, problematic laws like um, leftover from um, like say sedation laws and so on, uh, it creates an environment where it's really difficult um, to get uh, quality information, uh, even if there are initiatives within government to do so. Um, and the second part I would say is that we often also look in terms of how we measure quality is to actually look at the examples of where we want to be or we hope to be. Uh, and for that, we often use, you know, my society's uh, set of services. Um, for example, they work for you or Ella Vitelli for FOI. Uh, we look at the UK government digital service. Um, we do look, you know, we're fans of Democracy Club and what you, they do <laughs> during elections. Um, you know, and also, you know, the work around, say, beneficial ownership data standards, right? Um, so what we found is that we then use those uh, and then in terms to access the quality that we have, we then check are we able to do these things? Uh, and that's how we actually check on whether the quality that we have, uh, the data that we have available uh, allows us to do such things. And more often than not, when we measure these things, there's a lot of things that we find out that we don't have when we wanna do something. Um, just to be quick, like for an example, my society has this um, you know, common U UI that says, put in your postcode and find your MPs. So a common situation in Malaysia is like, okay, let's have that feature too. And then we find out that there is no data available that actually maps um, locations where, or areas that the postcode covers in Malaysia. So that's not possible <laughs> to do all those things. So, yeah. So that's how we actually measure, you know, uh, where's the quality and where are the gaps by looking at, you know, best practices, uh, ideal applications that we would like to do, um, and then measuring about where the gaps are for us in Malaysia. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, if you're if you're just joining us, do feel free to say hello and tell us who you are in the chat. Um, in a, in a, about in a few minutes' time, we'll uh, open up the Padlet boards and uh, allow everyone else to get involved as well. But before we do that, uh, we're going to hear from Sim about uh, dilemmas uh, faced when accessing quality information. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, just to just to I think we have a slightly different context to some of the other organisations here in that we mostly deal with um, election pre-election information. So 
we have a very short time frame in which our services are relevant. It's, you know, at most two months before the election happens itself. Um, and realistically, it's just in the week or the day of, of election. Um, that causes a few interesting things that that may be a different shape of problem to everyone else's. Um, first of all, UK election um, administration is fragmented. It's, it's, it's organised at the local authority level, which means that there are, for a national election, there are 400 separate organisations that, um, that carry the data that we need. And no other part of the UK state um, aggregates or joins that data together. Um, so we have a, a sort of a, a fragmented data problem um, where we have to very quickly um, gather data from lots of sources into one place standardize it make it useful to people um, so that's that's kind of one shape of problem that we have um, another another one is again I, I mentioned the timeliness um, I make a distinction between sort of I haven't got good words for it but maybe re real-time data versus statistical data and what I mean by that is the UK has a has a superb statistical office um, where there are there's lots and lots of very high quality information about the state, um, but the publication cycle, almost by definition, is is lagging what really happened. So if you want to know, um, you know, some performance standard from the previous year, you can almost certainly find it. But if you want to find it, uh, you know, uh, for today, it's it's basically impossible to do. Um, that doesn't matter most of the time, but but. If you think about the election time frame, that's that's really important to us. Um, one really practical example of that is um, electoral boundaries um, aren't published until about six months after the first election for those boundaries. So if you want to know, you know, who's who's got an election happening, um, you you can't find out until six months after the elections happened. Um, and it feels like lots of the conversations about open data. Um, don't really take that into consideration. Um, there are lots of good open data portals we've got in the UK, data.gov.uk, um, which does a good job. But as I say, it's always post hoc statistical data uh, that has this quality where it's it's been written once and it will never be changed. It's a it's a snapshot. Um, so yeah, I think of I think of lots of open data as as almost like printing a book and putting it on a shelf you know, in an archive. Uh, than having it as a service that's available. Um, and uh, uh, working on that, I think, is really difficult and a, a real sort of cultural change, because when we say open data, I mean one thing and lots of people mean the other thing. Um, there, there's, there's a fair amount of other stuff that I've, I could talk about, but I think those are the two, the sort of timeliness and uh, fragmentation are the, are the two things that I've got there. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Sim. When I say brilliant, thank you for your contribution rather than brilliant. That's what's actually happening in the real world. Um, and thank you all for keeping uh, very much to time as well. So we're now going to um, set a timer for about five minutes to give everyone the opportunity for a bit of silent working. Um, you can answer the question, what dilemmas have you faced or are you facing when accessing quality information or data for your civic tech project? on the Padlet, uh, that's under column one, that's where the question is, uh, or you can also use the chat here on Zoom. Uh, so five minutes, off you go. Brilliant, well, thank you very much, everyone. We'll have a quick look at what everyone's put down. Thanks for all of those contributions. Um, and once we've done that, if anybody would like to uh, contribute any thoughts, um, sort of verbally, orally, um, do put your hand up using the reactions button that you should see probably at the bottom of Zoom. So let's see what we've got on the Padlet. Uh, we've got inconsistency, which is something that's come up already. Um, there seems to be standards um, in some cases, but not in others. And things might be put into scanned PDFs, which are difficult to use. Um, when measuring the quality of information, we use examples of civic tech that work, such as those in the UK, which is a point that we've already heard as well. Um, there are formats that don't allow robots to read, so the data is not in a machine-readable format. Uh, there's gatekeeping by organisations who stop uh, the information being released. Poor knowledge of the Freedom of Information Act on the side of public officials. I think a lot of us can relate to that one. Um, efficiency of government services. Services may not be fully equipped or resourced. Um, to be able to deal with some of those data requests. 
forms used for data collection do not collect all of the data required for a full open data publication. And uh, we've got an example from open data services and open ownership about beneficial ownership data. Data is not available at city scale, uh, so some problem with uh, different boundaries. Government officials have negative perception on the information requested and will feel that the information will be used to expose certain corrupt acts. Uh, there's a lack of transparency. Uh, things are not available because it's filed as a national security issue or various other things. Um, we've got a range of repressive and vague laws for access to information data in Malaysia, which we've heard a bit about. Uh, most valuable data lives on private platforms that are inconsistent partners. For example, social media platforms who are very inconsistent in how they share things over time. There may be particular challenges in including children as rights holders uh, in particular bits of data. Personal data may be present in public data sets uh, and governments uh, may not have the data. It might not have the data that we expect it to hold. And here on the chat, we've also got uh, nepotism being a possible problem. Uh, we need education uh, to help people use it as well. Uh, so lots, lots to think about there, lots of food for thought. Uh, does anybody have any further reflections on any of that that they want to share before we move on to the next question? Uh, if you do, please do use the um, hand, the raising hand uh, tool that you should find under reactions at the bottom of your screen. Anybody got anything to add on any of that? Do any of our discussants want to come in on any? Oh, we've got uh, we've got a hand up from Hamza. Uh, we should be able to unmute you and uh, hear what you think. Excellent. Go for it, Hamza. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, quickly, just to share that in Nigeria we have a problem of the public officials actually are so uh, are scared of sh sharing some information. Uh, because some of them are even uh, worried that, that they may lose uh, their job or they may get queried or some concerns. I remember recently I went to um, a ministry of um, works where I actually had written requesting for an information on an abundant project and they had refused to give me the information. So I had to go. When I went, I met a director at the ministry and he said, um, the information you are looking for, actually, we can't give you. And I asked why. Uh, he said, uh, I'm not permitted to, to give you. So um, to summarize, I had to give him a copy of the Freedom of Information Act that we have in Nigeria. And that director admitted to me, he is not even aware of the Freedom of Information Act. So eventually, he gave me the information I requested. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Hamza. So we've got people not being aware of the, uh, the sort of requirements of various information law as well. Uh, anybody else uh, want to put their hand up? Otherwise, we can move on. Oh, Sim. I, I don't have a hand button because I'm a, I'm a host, so it's, I didn't know where I was trying to look for it. Um, I think it, there's something really interesting about, so in, in our case, um, we have a very good working relationship with the UK Electoral Commission, and that's essentially because the Commission understands that we're providing a service that isn't really controversial and is useful to the public a, 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 as a whole, um, and is complementary to the existing laws and sort of augmenting it. Um, and, we, and we still have frustrations inside that, but it's not fundamentally a, a combative relationship. So I think there's something really interesting about if you're trying to get information about from the government about something that will fundamentally embarrass them or, or show corruption or bring them down, you're going to have a much harder time than if you're doing something that uh, facilitates better service delivery that they want to have happen. Um, and that relationship between um, the, the long-term aspect of civic tech projects and their relationship to the state is a really fascinating dynamic that, that maybe it's not for this call, but I think that's a, that's a great sort of thing to, to think about as well in part of all this. Excellent, thank you. So things, things may change as uh, sort of uh, product services and relationship matures over time. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Nehemiah, over to you. I mean, just to add to what Sim said, um, when, when the government agency or the officials realize the value you, you present with 
the idea of what you want to use the data for, they would um, release it. And uh, case in point, just like you mentioned, electoral commission, same here in Ghana, when we wanted to um, digitize the information on where to find a polling station to get registered for elections. Um, initially, they didn't want to give us the data. We scraped that from their site. And then once we put that online, they realized that, oh, this is what the guys wanted to do. Um, and this is something. And then we also got people to use short codes to, to get that. And immediately they gave us the correct one. So they gave us one that we were not expecting because of the initial um, pushback. But I think sometimes they need to clearly understand what you are trying to do to, to get them to um, jump on board. So value um, proposition should be a way to get um, data from some of these folks. Excellent. Thank you. And before we move on to the next question, I'll take a quick contribution from Orioni. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Orioni from Nigeria. And um, I think my, my own feedback sometimes it's about like Sim said, it's about um, civic tech and uh, demanding for accountability and um, you know exposing corruption sometimes. I know we worked on a project, um, Investor Basic Education Project in Nigeria. Um, this time around, we scripted from the budget and um, we were able to put out like seven projects from the budget. However, when we wrote to the national body, we discovered there were over 119 projects in that same year. And that was because they could release the information. Now, the, the, the funny thing was we, we actually requested for one state at the time that was released. By the time we went back to say we needed for other states, then there was a pushback. And it was that, oh, we cannot release these projects to you. You need to go to the state level. So. Sometimes it's always funny with, with civic tech when we're trying to push, push this information out there, how they can be pushed back from um, government officials, even though they know what you're trying to do at the end of the day. So it's, it's different stories for different countries. I think that's my feedback. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll now move on to our second question. Um, and that is what, if anything, have people already done to try and address some of the issues that we've discussed so far? Uh, this relates to question two, column two on the Padlet. Um, and I'm going to go to Carol first this time, because I know um, he has to go uh, fairly soon. So over to you. Um, yep. So what we've learned um, is the fact that, you know, we still try to implement, um, you know, like our, like either, you know, like they work for you or Ella Vitelli. Uh, within our local context um, and when we do these things um, we actually learned that you know we we learned about that we can implement it in a way that works in our environment that you know with the faces uh, challenges that we face them um, so some interesting things that we learned for example is that uh, for example that budeshi i think in um, east africa uh, or nigeria and ended up with a similar approach to us in malaysia Whereas like if we don't have open contracting data uh, and it's all in digital documents, then we can still have open contracting data if we you know, get those documents, scan them in and then convert them into data. So, uh, so we're still able to do it, but you know, in a roundabout manner. Uh, the other thing that we learn is that sometimes we adapt some of these tools um, in a way that makes sense for us. Um, so, for example, I, um, my society had a project earlier where they try to store um, data on all politicians, um, you know, in an open data standard. Um, and then here in Malaysia, we're like, well, the politicians are also businessmen <laughs> and also, uh, you know, um, uh, and also possibly criminals as well. So we ended up actually putting up all the data um, on all the businessmen and their relationships in a database that was supposed to be meant for, um, you know, to power day work for you. Um, and so it did work really well for us um, in the sense that it solved our needs uh, and our political situations where politicians and businessmen and cronies are the same people. <laughs> um, but in a way that works for us, that 
actually ended up breaking my society's interface <laughs> because of the different use cases. Um, so yeah, so what we've learned is that, you know, these challenges um, are not always a hindrance. Uh, it can actually lead to us learning more about how to actually use them in our local context. Um, uh, and, okay, so, and just another point, for example, is like for like Elevitelli, even if you don't have an FOI Act, what we learn in Malaysia is that uh, we can still apply, you know, the standards on how to measure performance from Elevitelli. Uh, and then we also learned that just the act of um, storing all the different requests um, it actually gives us data on a mapping of which government agencies actually hold the data that we're looking for. So it's not just whether it's an FY request, but other things just by learning from, you know, local implementation. So yeah, that's um, what I got to share. Excellent. Thank you. Some, some grounds for optimism there, which is always good. Um, I'll go to Sim next this time. Sure. So I... I think that as the two things I, I said before, so there's the, the fragmentation and then there's the um, uh, timeliness of official data. On the fragmentation, we've essentially used crowdsourcing. We have we have a huge community of people who uh, have a very focused weekend uh, getting all of the candidate data that we need. Um, uh, it's coming up in a couple of weeks if anyone wants to take part um i can, I can share details um so so that's been a huge thing and that community maintenance has meant that a job that would take one organization thousands of hours is is can be done in in a, in a weekend which is um really great um the timeliness stuff and the, and the infrastructure stuff um we've just built a lot of the very very basic infrastructure that we need to exist um we we manually build a database of all of the boundaries that take place um, uh, just so that we can get that data before it's published officially, which is far too late for us. Um, that sort of work that, um, I mean, it works, it's a solution, but trying to find any sort of uh, sustainability or funding for that thing when you try and explain even what the problem space is and all the funders get really bored and don't want to hear about Shape files and things like that is is interesting. So it's it's a funny bit of hidden work that we've got that we need to try and find a good way of communicating because it's not apparent that well, as someone said earlier, you know, if you want that really nice my society looking postcode to thing uh, service, you've got to have the bit in the middle, and that's the boring bit, but it's the important bit. So um, that, that's that's about that. Also, as I just alluded to in my comment before. We've just partnered with with those 400 organizations, the 400 uh, local authorities. We've spent a long time making friends with them. Um, it's not easy. And it's again, it's quite it's quite boring. Not that they're boring, but it's quite boring to have to do have the same conversation 400 times. Um, and that's something that we've only been able to do by hanging about for the last six years or so uh, and, and getting more trust from the from the state itself. Excellent. Thank you. Really interesting how both of you talked about the sort of way that you've had to fill in the infrastructure, have to sort of work around um, how government is approaching what should um, really be basic information release, but never turns out to be that basic or straightforward. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Laura next. In our case, related to the challenge about uh, formats not able for, for robots, it, it is more or less. Uh, as Sim said, is one-to-one -one conversation with organizations that are working, trying to, to improve the access to information policies in general, because uh, from Chicago, we are not necessarily sitting in the same table as government, asking them to change their policy. Then what we try to do is to also give some examples for the organizations that are doing that work to knock the door of the government and explain with, with specific details why that is a problem and the present problem not necessarily something that's going to happen in 10 years uh, today is a problem and and related to to the discretion or or that decision of when when the government decides to change for example the period of the publication or stop publishing something that used to be published in the past, et cetera. Uh, we use the more traditional strategy of the watchdog uh, journalists uh, saying, having a good conversation with the public servant in the private conversation, but saying to his or her 
uh, we should tell the word this because if not, they are not costs of the decisions you are making and that decisions is or are affecting the, the access to information right of millions of people. Then we use that both strategy, one more uh, trying to help the, the people and um, there's a lot of people trying to push this agenda inside the, go the, the governments or the con parliaments or etc. But on the other side, helping them also to put it on the front page or put it on the agenda to, to, to make a cost of, of that type of decision. And the historical strategy that we have in Chequeado and all around the world in different fact checkers is we, we work to, to make people be more interested about good data. And then we are working on the demand, uh, showing, for example, when something is, uh, is information and using data to explain that we are trying the people to value more that then that's that's the general one not necessarily a specific talent but the the big big talents that all of us has related to how we involve more people and not just we that are expert or activists in in the importance of this we need better data to make better decisions then if if people don't don't realize, don't pay enough attention to that. Uh, government has less incentive to invest money or, or to take this uh, seriously. Excellent, thank you. And I think I think really interesting way of thinking about the demand side uh, as well as the supply side when it comes to solutions as well. Uh, Nehemiah, over to you. For us, it's it's been a situation where we've try to leverage relationships that we've built. Um, I mean, especially with people who have the decision-making power. Um, um, I mean, this can be expensive in the long term due to the considerations involved, but it's convenient compared to the frustration one, one has to go through. So sometimes we'll invite them to a brown bag series, which is a learning events, and they would sit in there and see the importance of of um, the work that we do to everyone, every stakeholder, including citizens, which obviously they are they are part of even before holding the positions that they hold. And, and so sometimes either out of embarrassment or out of just better understanding of our needs and the needs of citizens, um, they would then work with us to, to change the situation or the status quo rather than stick to what they, they've always done. And so it's been, it's been helpful in a lot of ways. In certain instances, we may be asked to actually either advise on how information should be made available on their websites or, or even in different forms and what would be the best way to do that. In certain instances, they've even asked us to actually either build the technology for them um, to capture certain types of information. So um, relationships, it has been a good approach for us to, to solve this um, problem. Excellent, thank you. And again, it's a really strong theme that's coming through, having to build those relationships over quite a long time, put quite a lot of effort um, into doing that and helping people sort of learn uh, what's going on and what they need to be doing. Thank you. Um, so we're now going to give, um, unless Carol, you want uh, to reflect on any of that before you leave. I don't know if you want to come in quickly. No, it's okay. Um, just before I leave, I actually put it in the third Padlet, you know, on things that we can do. Um, so there's a little picture there, and I hope it's self-explanatory. Um, so um, my colleagues are actually here, Kelly and Isad. <laughs> so if you have any questions on that approach, um, yeah, do contact them. And again, thank you so much for having me. Um, we're out and, um, you know, giving the time before I jump off um, to the next call right now. So again, oh, thank pleasure. You. Thank you yeah. for joining us. Um, and for everybody else, um, we're now going to spend five minutes uh, thinking about that second question. What, if anything, have you done to try and address uh, some of the issues? 
Um, it's column two on the Padlet. Feel free to put some contributions on there, column two on the Padlet, or you can use the chat here on Zoom as well. Uh, we'll have five minutes for that, uh, a bit of silent working, and then again, we'll have some time for reflection and for people to chip in. So five minutes, what, if anything, have you done to try and address these issues? Second column on the Padlet. And time is up. Let's see what we've got in column two of the Padlet. What, if anything, have you done to try and address these issues? Um, I think a lot of similar themes emerging, including to what our, from what our discussant said as well. Uh, publish stories in the media to increase the cost of stopping publishing or not publishing data. Um, archiving uh, government websites, uh, just in case any documents should go offline. That's a good one. Um, Speaking with the Information Commissioner here in the UK when freedom of information requests have been refused, and obviously there are similar uh, organisations and officials elsewhere as well. Work with the public sector to improve data capture, uh, something that open data services and open ownership are working on. Uh, we've heard a bit already about post-publication re-standardisation to try and to wrangle those different formats into something that's a bit more consistent. Uh, approaching data to citizens, so open data for citizens through platforms, webinars, science diffusion and grounded uh, ground based collaboration. Collaboration between non governmental organizations and government as well as so requesting information through the relevant government ministry to try to solve some issues and um, retaining a good relationship with the government so trying to avoid uh, that confrontational approach and again developing personal relationships to get access to research data as well. Excellent. Uh, does anyone have any reflections they'd like to share on any of that? Again, please use the uh, reactions button uh, to raise your hand if you can, or um, sort of say in the chat uh, otherwise, or if you're one of our discussants, you can actually put your hand up and I'll be able to see that. Anyone got any thoughts on any of that before we go for a short break? No reflections on any of that. Monica, let's, uh, let's hear from you. We'll unmute you. Thank you. Um, I think for me, it's interesting to see that in other countries. I am in Mexico. Um, a lot, um, we are interested in the quality of data related to the quality of water. So um, along um, like 20 or 30 years ago, some of the researchers that found a, a bad quality of water, they uh, have like uh, this confrontation to government alliances and maybe published information with uh, journalists and make like a lot of fussy because they don't uh, care about these issues uh, despite of the, um, several negative effects to, to health. Um, and now we are like approaching like more uh, collaboration with them and they're more open, there's more information, citizens are more aware of different things. And I think that um, this uh, culture, the, the transformation of culture, like, like the awareness and this public of, uh, policies of the open government data and things like that are helping a lot of, of countries through that. And uh, it is interesting to see that um, this is happening in another countries because I have like this sense that maybe it is not being in the same way, but I was glad to see that it is going through this way. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, it's always always helpful to know who else is going through uh, similar things and that there are a lot of similarities between countries, but also some differences um, as well. Um, does anybody else want to come in on this uh, before we go for a short break? Excellent. In which case, um, we'll take a short break now where you can uh, grab a drink, uh, pop to the bathroom, or continue to uh, add some things in the chat and on the Padlet board. And we'll start again 
uh, at 10 past three, uh, where our next question will be, what do you think might help further address the issues that we've been talking about? Are there any resources or evidence missing that would be helpful to us if they did exist? That's the question we'll come back to at 10 past three. Um, but for now, we'll be taking a short break for nine minutes or so. Excellent. Well, it's 10 past three, uh, so we will get restarted. Um, and in a few moments, I'll ask our discussants uh, to give their reflections on our next question, which is what do you think might help further address the issues that we've discussed? Are there any resources? Is there any evidence missing that would be helpful uh, to us if they did exist? Um, and I will start um, by going to Natty, uh, Natty Carthy, who's joined us from the Open Data Charter first. Um, and I know I've also been looking through um, everything that people have put on the Padlet from the first couple of questions as well. So Natty, if you've got any reflections on some of the challenges and dilemmas that you face in accessing information, um, and if you've got any ideas for what you've already done to try and address some of those, we'd love to hear those as well as anything else that you think would help address the issues. So um, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thanks. And then sorry for being late. I had a previous, uh, previous call that I needed to participate in. Um, so uh, during the break, I, I started reading what, what everybody was uh, writing. So the Open Data Charter actually uh, promotes openness from, from governments. And um, some of the challenges that we've been meeting uh, now that we're fundamentally working on thematic open data, openness, um, we've encountered maybe kind of a higher level of, of uh, problems in understanding what the data means. And, and let me just double click on that. For example, we've been working on, on climate change data. Um, there's a massive amount of data that governments create around that theme, uh, most of which, at least with the governments that we worked with, was created in order to like internally being used and to uh, send to the UN as a reporting mechanism and, and government officials didn't understand why that, that data, like which added value openness would bring to that data. But aside from that, not that, now that those governments are starting to publish that data, the level of technicity that the climate change data community actually, um, actually works within uh, made, it, made it difficult for the open data folks, civil society organizations from, from open data community to actually understand what the data was was like saying, uh, because there's a really high level of, of technicity and, and terms and, and everything within the climate change community. So it's not even kind of, we, we, we kind of started to uh, un understand that we needed data translators, you know, like uh, in order for, for example, to do a hackathon or, or online innovation uh, challenge or something like that, we couldn't just say, okay, just call people to reuse the data and figure out uh, what to do with that because because they were stuck um so so and and each thing that we've been working on uh, aside from the anti-corruption which is kind of the the old uh the the old and that everybody knows uh agenda um it's still really important anyway um those are kind of the, the challenges that we're meeting uh it's it's not that easy once the data is out there the reuse uh bit as the data is getting super technical, um, it's it's it, it's a really uh, high entry um, barrier, um, and and climate change is super clear. Um, so I guess I guess that's that's one of the reflections that I, that I have, uh, and uh, and so to be able to add value by reusing that for civic tech projects, um, it's it's harder, and we're working on that, but. It, I, but that's one of the biggest challenges that we've met in the last couple of years. Excellent, thank you. And do you think there's anything that could help address um, some of those problems um, as well? If you sort of start moving uh, the event into the practical solutions that we might consider, anything that you think, uh, any resources or evidence that's currently missing that would be quite helpful to us in tackling some of those challenges? So what, what we've done is kind of make the connections between the, the public servants that are actually kind of creating the data and uh, civil society organizations. So they can actually speak 
and understand what a, like a national contri determined contribution means so that then the data it's it's more understandable. It doesn't even have to do with metadata. It like it, you you could have like a data dictionary behind it, but national and like like that term actually means something only for the for the climate change community. So we need it to have those conversations happening. Um, also also with with civil society organizations that work within the climate change community that don't recognize themselves as data organizations also kind of bringing them into the conversation and kind of um, making the point that that even their advocacy projects will could be stronger if they use the data so trying to make that shift towards them not not, not seeing themselves as part of the data co conversation into like yeah data will help your your but you you might not be a kind of a data mining organization whatsoever but data will help your case uh, but it's just bringing everybody together via events, uh, sessions, roundtables, blogs, uh, podcasts. So anything can help uh, to kind of lower that entry, as I was saying, like that, that, that entry barrier. Excellent. Thanks, Natty. I'll go to Laura next. Uh, I, I, hi, Nati. I listened to Nati and, and she remember me, the the same problem that we have from the beginning. Perhaps today it's a bit more sophisticated for people that work on data, because the barrier is for us. But what I what I think is that these kind of translators or people trying to explain why this data can matter me should be part of the gap that the data community or civil tech uh, uh, had been having for a long, long time, for, for, the, for decades. It, um, I, I think perhaps the new thing is in the institutional level or the anti-corruption, lots of the people that work in data feel more comfortable with the terms or the quality of the data, etc. But the citizens that we supposed to serve don't necessarily under, used to understand us. Uh, the new thing is with the climate change agenda or perhaps the uh, gender agenda or etc. There are specific things that also the data community uh, needs to know before uh, this translator for citizens. But perhaps this is what, what I'm trying to add is perhaps what Nati said um, is not necessarily a problem because they put us in the same situation that it, most of the citizens used to be in the past related to our own agenda. Because what I, I think is we always have this gap between data and uh, why that's gonna matter to me? I, I don't know if 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 I was clear enough uh, to 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 make my point. But what I'm saying is, I listened to her and said, okay, perhaps this is a problem or a chance or an opportunity to to be more realistic about the gap that perhaps in the past we didn't have the chance to realize. Excellent. Thank you, Lara. I think, um, yeah, there's some quite profound points in there about um, understanding and, and intermediaries between different groups and, and government and particularly with the public as well. Um, so if anyone knows of any resources or evidence um, on some of that, uh, that would actually be a really helpful uh, thing to add to the Padlet. Um, I'm going to go to Nehemiah next and then we'll hear from Sim after that. Thank you very much. Um, so for, for us or for me, um, I believe that I mean, the full activation of the right to information law in Ghana um, would help, would go a long way to help solve this problem. I think um, currently the way, the way they've, they've um, implemented the law is to put a gatekeeper, a commission that oversees um, people requesting for information and then waiting till the information has been made available or, or, or the commission would 
maybe give you a note or a letter or something to go to the state agency to get the information. I think that that in itself is a bottleneck. And so um, proper activation of, of the law and, and enforcing agencies to release information will be important. But also critically, if, if we find ourselves in a place where some critical information is not subjected to ask and get basis, but um, it's available and accessible by default, then it helps everyone, civil society, citizens, um, academia, anytime you need information, you know that once you're working on this area, um, the information is available by default. And so um, all you need is to go to this particular place, whether it's a web portal, um, or even if you went into their environment, they may have some information kiosk there for you to access information, then it will be a good way to go. But also, maybe if there was a, a clearinghouse sort of for all public data, um, then it will help because I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about the countries, other countries, uh, but in, in Ghana, the information is scattered across different government agencies um, and even different offices or departments. And sometimes it makes it difficult to make sense of or even have try to have access to them. Um, and so um, in order to ensure that eschew any form of delays or any form of frustrations, um, if we had a clearinghouse where all the information is, and I I just go to this particular place and I need ABC and have access to it, then it will be, it will, it will be an awesome way to go about it. Um, and maybe another approach would be building capacity for those who work in these agencies to sometimes be able to put the data in, in forms that is easily consumable, especially if for people like us who want to ensure that it's machine readable, and then it will be easier for us um, rather than going to get a pile load of paper and coming to scan them and OCR them before you, you can actually do any form of work with. So it's just, it's just a situation where um, there's, there, there has to be commitment from the government side in terms of stakeholders for us to be able to um, have access and make use of the information the way we, we, we need and we ought to. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So government delivering on things it's already promised in terms of information laws, but also somewhere where we can we can find all of the information and understand how to access it, but also supporting people inside government to understand how they should publish it on our behalf. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Sim. Uh, yeah, it's it's a big one, isn't it? It's, uh, it's there's lots of things to think about. Um, the thing that's really clear, I said in the chat, the thing that's really clear to me is that the, the tech part of civic tech is really perhaps overplayed sometimes. And um, what we really need to be doing is is having a doing a good job at building these relationships, both with people in the government and the, the potential users, whether they're journalists or the general public um, outside. Um, I really liked the point earlier about, I, and I don't want to kind of set up a, a sort of a, a hierarchy or gold standard here to say that, you know, my society is, is, is uh, you know, what everyone should be aspiring to, although I do like my society. Uh, but that, that point of going, you know, to what extent can we implement uh, a freedom of information website? To what extent can we implement they work for you? Do we have boundaries that allow us to go from postcode to boundaries? You know, uh, trying to, to have... Um, a sort of a, a, a ranking or a, a, a checklist of things that are the capabilities that are there, and then some presentations of what you might do. You know, if you had capability X in your country, what could you then do with it, and why is that important? I think trying to evidence those things is is really important, um, and and we get maybe a bit lost in the in the tech side of it. Um, and if I can, if I can insert a thing that I think we should do less of, which is sort of the same same as my first point, is I think we focus a lot on, on data standards and standardization and maybe lead with that in our approaches to fixing things. Because when you're in the weeds, I mean, I really understand it. When you're in the weeds of trying to do something, you, you, you feel yourself saying, if only this was all, if only somebody else could do this work, basically, if only this was all standardized and, and I could just do the fun bit, um, it would all be better. And then you start pushing for a standard. But really, when you push for a standard, what you're not doing is explaining why you want that and what, what the value is to everybody else. And I think we probably should spend more time demonstrating that value 
than talking about the need for the standards um, because it's a, a bit a bit too tech heavy for a lot of people. Excellent, thanks. And yes, trying to make it <clears throat> understandable to, to as many people as possible why these things matter. I think it's absolutely vital. So um, we're now going to give everyone five minutes of silent working on uh, the this question, uh, which is going to be column three on the Padlet. Do you feel free to put things in the chat as well. Five minutes on what do you think might help you further address the issues that we've discussed, i.e. are there any resources or evidence missing that will be helpful to you if they did exist? So that's the third column on the Padlet. Five minutes has already started. Excellent. So let's see what we've got in the Padlet. What do we think might help us further address these issues? Are there any resources or evidence missing that would be helpful if they did exist? Uh, well, we've got moving the mindset in a way of accessing information on an institutional rather than a personal level. So accessing information through uh, good personal work relationships, so sort of taking it up beyond that. Uh, we've got building tools for open data analysis, again, open data services, uh, have developed some tools that might help people do that. Understanding the underlying problem that data is supposed to help solve before we start advocating for open data. So it's about publishing with a purpose, excellent. Understanding that to publish good data, you need to help people provide you with it, so helping them do so. Explaining the value of open data standards rather than just advocating for open data standards in, of, in and of themselves, which we've already touched on a little bit. And programs that make data available and useful for civil society. Excellent, thank you for all of those. Uh, does anyone have any further reflections on any of that? Uh, if you do, you can raise your hand uh, using the uh, raise hand tool under reactions, or if you're one of our discussants, you can just put your hand up and I will see you doing so. Anyone that wants to come in on any of that? No. In which case we can move to the final section uh, of today's civic tech surgery. Uh, so thank you everyone for a really good discussion so far. So we've considered what the challenges are, how people have previously tried to overcome them, and some things that we perhaps like available to help us tackle those challenges in future. What we're going to do in this last section is start thinking really practically about some possible solutions. So the action lab or working group that will come after today's civic tech surgery will have two and a half thousand US dollars available to commission a project that aims to solve one of the problems that we've highlighted today. So what we'd like to do in the time that remains is consider two things. First of all, what's already out there that could help us solve the problems we've identified? Is there existing evidence? Are there existing resources that could help us tackle the dilemmas we've discussed? That's column four on our Padlet, uh, just so we don't end up reinventing the wheel and commissioning something that already exists and that we could be using to help us. And the second question is, what project projects could we fund to help us with the dilemmas we've discussed? Or as column five on the Padlet puts it, if there was one thing the Tic Tech Action Lab could commission to help you better access quality information or data for civic tech projects, what would it be? That could be learning materials, it could be events, it could be training, it could be case studies, it could be research, it could be all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So we're going to give you, I think, eight minutes or so, um, and we may not even need that long, we might cut that, get cut that a little bit short, to think about those questions. Uh, so what resources and evidence, et cetera, is already available and what the Tic Tech Action Lab could commission that's currently missing. Uh, those are columns four and five on the Padlet. You can put thoughts in the chat as well. Um, and obviously take a bit of time to read through what everybody else has put there as well. Once we've done that, uh, we'll spend some time discussing and reflecting upon what we have. So eight minutes on the timer. We might not use all of it uh, to fill in columns four and five of the Padlet what resources and evidence are already out there, and what the Tic Tech Action Lab could commission that would help us overcome some of the problems in accessing quality information. So hopefully the time will start now. Excellent, thank you everyone for all of those. Let's see what we've got. 
So let's start with the existing evidence or research or projects that may help with some of our dilemmas. Uh, we've got the open up guide on climate change data, uh, which is linked there, I think, which is great. Uh, we've got OGP, the Open Government Partnership, uh, which may be useful in understanding what open government data is already available in your country. We've got Social TIC or Social TIC. Uh, this non-governmental organisation helps with technology appropriation. Sounds interesting. If you put that down, please do feel free to add a bit more detail in the Zoom chat. Be interested to hear more. Uh, we've got legislation advice, so how easy it might it be to get, for instance, uh, an FOI law in a particular country, how to draft it, and how could the campaign be started. Uh, that might actually be slipping into number five as well, things that the Tech Tech Action Lab could commission some sort of guidance on how to do that. Uh, we've got uh, various projects which rank countries uh, when it comes to things like open data, for instance, the open data barometer. Uh, we've got the CINAR project in Malaysia. We're working from the ground up in applying best practices and standards. We may be able to learn from some of the work they've done, uh, particularly when it comes to specific communities facing particular problems. We've got data partnerships. Uh, so for instance, Facebook has funded multiple civic tech groups to, to, to collect data and share that with the rest of the world. We've got uh, UK law providing access to public sector data sets and some resources around that. And um, we've got Alvatelli, uh, which is the, the sort of engine powering, what do they know, um, and other um, FOI related services around the world. When it comes to Padlet column five, there was one thing the Tic Tech Action Lab could commission that would help us access better quality information or data for civic tech projects. We have got case studies um, that focus on things that don't work and not only the successful experiences, Interesting. Uh, we've got training civil society and community-based organisations on the relevance of access and quality information and guiding them on how to engage the relevant institutions. All very practical so far. Um, we've got events and training to improve storytelling skills of public servants and data organisations or NGOs um, and, and journalists as well. Training on data, open data and data mining for thematic civil society organisations so they can learn to better use the data out there. And um, something we touched on earlier, many CSAs do not recognize themselves as data organizations. Uh, this was mentioned earlier as well, a clearinghouse for data that's been made available to date. And we may have an example from the Knight Foundation already on that. Research um, on how to access and on how access to information laws apply to data sets and how those laws work, work in practice. So again, it's been quite practical to help people use that. Um, and yes, yeah, somebody's given an example of being unsuccessful in asking for a particular FOI to be provided as an ongoing data set, which I, I think in the UK, there is something in the Act which should allow you to do that, but whether the government is applying it uh, is probably a very different question. And I think we've got some useful things uh, in the chat from Monica as well, uh, which goes to the social TIC. Um, so it's a Spanish website that can be translated to English uh, as well. Excellent. So I will go to our discussants, uh, first of all, see if they have uh, any reflections on all of that. I'll go to Sim first, then Nassi, then Nehemiah, then Laura. So Sim, what do you think? I was worried you'd come to me first. I need more time to reflect. But uh, no, I, I, it's, it's, there's, there's loads of good stuff in here. Um, I have to say, uh, my confession is that I end up being quite blinkered. You know, you, you work on your day job and focus on the jobs that you see in front of you and and maybe don't think about the wider international network uh, or even national network in the UK sometimes. Um, but I guess I'll take this opportunity to say if 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 I can help anyone on this call, I'm very happy to chat about things. We've got some experience of doing this stuff in the UK um, and, and I'd like to hear more about the stuff and a, a sort of open offer to, to talk more with others. Um, I think fundamentally that's what it's going to come down to is more events like like Tech Tech is trying to host, um, and, uh, and more collaboration between the, the practitioners in this space. Fantastic. Thank you, Sim. Uh, let's go to Nassi next. But, uh, one thing that I, because I, I was reading the chat about the, the translation and everything, and, and one of the main things that I think um, could be done is actually translating into not only Spanish, which is my <laughs> my main language, um, a lot of existing re resources, and also French. There's a huge fran francophone open data community. Um, the last tools that we created in the open data charter were actually in Spanish, French, and English. 
because there's already a lot of resources but, but out there, but they're mainly in English and that actually makes it complicated mostly for Global South to, to be able to use those, those resources. So I guess that would be my main point. Excellent, thank you. So yes, I think, I think we have theme emerging about collaborating across borders and how we can make that as easy as possible. Excellent. Uh, Nehemiah, let's go to you next. I, I, I think that we need to focus on <clears throat> getting people tools that would be, should I say, simple to use and also giving them the, the skills or giving them the, the training to be able to do these things because once we are looking at the key requirements around availability and access, then um, people need to understand how to make the data or the information available and how to make it accessible in, in forms that people can easily consume. And so if, if we can simply just provide simple skills or simple tools for people to, to work with, in making data available and also in making data accessible, then um, we can get the masses to consume in our part of the world where um, sometimes um, internet may not be accessible or even if it's ac accessible may not be affordable, you want to always look at um, the most simplest or easiest ways for people to, to consume um, data and information. So if it, if it means having um, partners or stakeholders that would get the information closer to people or demystify the data and information, then it's a good thing. So collaboration and capacity building and, and, and tools are the way to go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So again, very strong themes of communities, collaboration, capacity and tools coming through there. Uh, Laura, over to you. Yeah, perhaps adding on that is, I agree that we need, uh, and I'm as, as it's clear, focus on how we fill the gap with citizens and not with experts. Then uh, create tools that can allow in a simple way that more people can or make requests or look for data, et cetera, but try to create and use uh, all the digital power of this community also to, to make me on board much more people. I, I just put in the, in the paddle uh, a tool that we create that basically helps people that are not necessary uh, people that know the law, how they can make a request then they they made simple questions that people should fill the gaps or the, the blanks and and just send it and it's not just one thing that we should do but i think we also should be doing that type of thing Excellent, thank you. So again, it's sort of using the expertise of this community, the sort of data and open data and transparency communities, but trying to reach beyond that uh, to give citizens and, as somebody put in the Padlet, those civil society organisations that work on particular areas that don't think about data as much to be able to give all of those uh, the tools and the capacity as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, does anyone else on the call have any reflections or anything they'd like to share on any of that? If you do, uh, please do use the raise hand tool down on the reactions button. Or of course, feel free to put it in the chat or on the Padlet as well. We will keep the Padlet open uh, for a short while after this event, so you can add some further things later. If nobody else has anything that they would like to say, then I'm just going to uh, sort of tell you about what happens next. And hopefully my screen share will work perfectly. Can people see a slide uh, by my screen share? Excellent, that's always a good start. Um, so as um, sort of mentioned earlier as well, um, civic tech surgery today was to sort of help surface some of the dilemmas and challenges and also to start thinking about some of the solutions. And what will happen is that we will come up with an action lab or working group um, that will take those further forward. 
So that action lab uh, will work together. They'll commission some work. Uh, we've got uh, up to two and a half thousand US dollars uh, to be able to commission some sort of project to help us tackle some of the dilemmas and challenges that we've raised today. Anybody can apply to join that action lab. Um, if you've come today, you're probably already on the Tech Tech mailing list or my society mailing list, um, which is where the information will be. Uh, but if you're not, please do sign up to the Tech Tech mailing list uh, because that's where the details will appear. Uh, I think the link will be going in the chat if it hasn't already. Um, and then once the working group, the Action Lab, uh, has thought about what they'd like to commission, then um, there will be a call for proposals published on the My Society website. Uh, again, sign up to the mailing list uh, to know exactly when that happens. Uh, and when the call proposal, call for proposals is published, you will be able to um, apply it for that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've already got a call for proposals out from the first action lab, which is about showcasing uh, public-private collaboration civic tech uh, success stories. Uh, so you've got until Monday to apply for that. Uh, there will be a call going out uh, at some point in the next few weeks on making civic tech accessible and inclusive. Um, but as I said, once the action lab following this civic tech surgery has met, there will be a call for proposals on something uh, which will help us all access quality data and information more easily. And you can indeed see the links in the chat. So unless anybody else has anything that they are desperately wanting to share with the group, uh, and as I said, we will be keeping the Padlet open uh, for a bit as well, so you can add things there. Um, I think all that remains for me to say is um, a huge thank you to our excellent uh, discussants. Thank you very much to you. Uh, thanks to everybody else who's joined us today. And thanks to National Endowment for Democracy as well for supporting the Tech Tech Labs programme. Um, so like I said, remember, um, keep an eye out for the call for proposals. Uh, you've got until Monday to apply for the first one that's out there. Uh, and yes, make sure that you sign up to the Tech Tech mailing list to keep up to date with everything. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day.